Welcome to the Night Mode edition of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. This is my dynamic co-host, Blue, We're on the Come and Talk to Me Network. We got a special guest today, but let's pay some bills real quick, Blue. Oh, yeah, Pops. Let me, let me go ahead and do this. Let me get this. Shout out to our sponsors, Underdog Fantasy. Go ahead and click the link in the description. They are matching a, a deposit of up to $250. Don't forget to use the promo code MARK. That's M-A-R-K. We appreciate y'all, man. Well, if you know basketball, my next guest, our next guest, needs no introduction. He's one of New York City's all-time great, not just point guards, but players. He's one of the greatest point guards in the history of basketball, period. My guy, drafted by the New York Knicks in 1988 with the 19th pick, University of DePaul, All-American at DePaul, All-American at Truman in the Bronx, went to Oak Hill Academy, just a special, special talent, and now the head coach at LIU Basketball, my brother, family for life, the legend, Rod Strickland. Coach, coach. What's up, fellas? What's up, bro? I've been looking forward to this right here. Man, we've been looking forward to it, too. We've been... It's been, it's been, I feel like it's been months up that my pops been telling me he was coming to join us. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I, 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 wanted, I wanted to come to the studio, but I couldn't make it. But maybe one day, but I was definitely looking forward to this. Yeah. Well, if you ever get to L.A., this isn't the last time that you're going to be on the show. We're definitely going to have you open Absolutely. invitation because you're basketball royalty, especially when it comes to New York sure. City. So you have an open invitation to come join us in the studio and just, just chop it up. But did you watch the game, uh, game three in the finals? I did. Got a chance to watch it. Uh, it was, you know, it was a good game. Uh, uh, Dallas kind of tried to come back at the end, got close. I thought Boston was going to give it away a little bit uh, in the end, but just too much, too much. You know, Boston, the driving kicks, the three-point shooting, you know, Tatum was strong in the first half. And then Jalen Brown, who's probably going to be the MVP, just took over. But, uh, you know, they had other guys that performed. Uh I just think Dallas, Kai, and uh, Luca just had to do too much. If you look at that last series, you know, those other guys, PJ, was it Gadford, uh, uh, Derek Jones, you know, those guys were able to, to, to score buckets and make play, even lively, kept balls alive and got them extra possessions. And, uh, you know, this series, they, they haven't been there. And all the pressure's on Luca and Kai. Well, Boston being up 3-0, do you think this series is over or do you think Dallas still has a chance? I mean, it's going to be tough. You never say no. Uh, you know, Kyrie and Luka are special offensive players, but, I mean, you're down 3-0. No one's done it in history. I, you know, so it's hard to go against history. You know, obviously I'm rooting for Dallas, uh, but it's going to be a tough uphill climb. The, the most important thing is to get the next one and start from there. Well, you sound like a coach, man. <laughs> now 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 coach i gotta ask you because i i can't let them off the hook i don't see the same defensive intensity from this dallas Mavericks team that i saw in the series prior now do you do you see the what do you see as far as the adjustments that have been made or a change in a a team that's as good as the celtics um what do you think that they can do to maybe spur uh, that that identity on defense that I've seen them have against a team like the Thunder or a team like the Timberwolves? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I just think they've kind of exploited Luka uh, and Kai at times, you know, on the defensive end. You know, they've, uh, you know, the switches, they've gone inside to Jason Tatum and made them pay for that. Uh, I think it's going to be tough. It's just going to have to be a team effort. But Luka, you know, Luka's going to have to defend. <laughs> Like, if you watch that game tonight, I think they looked, they sought him out a lot, uh, and they attacked him, and I think they've done the same with Kai. So those guys, you know, it's almost like your offense is your defense. And I I just don't think they've come across a team like Boston, who's, you know, you got the two great players in Tatum and Brown, but you got the others that are also making plays. You know, you got the shooter. You know, Hawford can always knock down the shot. Uh, Drew Holiday is just a special player overall. You know, he mm-hmm. can knock down shots. And just even on the other end, I think he's so such an incredible defender. Like, I watch him guard Kyrie. He's special. You know, like he understands I got to get up in him. I got to force him one way. And then he also directs him away from the basket. So mm-hmm. even though he's not exactly in front of him, he's guiding him the other way. 
And you, so I think it's more Boston than Dallas. You know, I think Boston is just showing that they're the better team right now. I, I, I had the privilege of coming to a LIU Pepperdine game and watching you as my former teammate coach. And I was proud just to watch you control the game, lead your team, and just your presence on the sideline. My question to you as a coach, if you're coaching the Dallas Mavericks and Luke is putting forth the type of effort or lack of effort defensively that he, that he quite honestly, is unacceptable, his mm -hmm. different approaches as a coach, how do you approach it to him? Do you direct it to him individually or, or talk to him in front of the team that he's got to be better for you guys to have a chance? I think you have to have that conversation in front of the team. Like, I don't think there's any way you can just go one-on-one, -on -one, and especially now you're down 3-0. I mean, that conversation should have been had, you know, beforehand, uh, before this 3-0 deficit. But that's a conversation with the team because the team has to understand it. You have to make him accountable in front of everyone. Uh, but, no, that's that's absolutely a conversation in front of the team. And, and actually, as leaders, you would hope that some of those players would actually have that conversation with him for you or with you. I can certainly see you coming up to me and be like, are you going to guard? <laughs> <laughs> you going to check somebody? <laughs> well, but you know what, though? Like, seriously, back in the day, I think guys talk more to each other and guys right. challenge yeah. each other and guys made each made others accountable. And that's probably because you had that age gap too, right? You had the older guys. You know, when we came in the league, like we were the young guys with older right. guys. And older guys were able to, to, to hold you accountable in one way or the other. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, you know what I mean? That's, that's what it was. Yeah. My question now, to you is, who is the best player on the Boston Celtics, in your opinion? Man, if you would have asked me this probably a, last week <laughs> or yesterday <laughs> or four days ago, I'd have said Jason Tatum. Uh, but Jalen Brown has obviously been the best player on the court. Uh, you know, his energy, his aggressiveness, you know, getting to the basket. And sometimes, like the both of those guys, sometimes they are out of control, right? And I think a lot of times Boston – you know, they, they almost help you get back in the game when they get leads. Like, you just never know. But just watching them, watching them in the playoffs and watching them, particularly this series, Jalen Brown is the best player on the court. Like, especially for Boston, there's no doubt about it. He's kind of been the engine uh, that's been making him go. But I love what Jason Tatum has done because he's allowed Jalen Brown to do that. I was worried that they would just have this battle. And there's times where you see it. But I think for the most part, for the most part, especially the first two games, like Jason Tatum gave the ball up. Right, he didn't shoot a great percentage, but he had a high assist. He had a high assist average, and I think that was great for for the Celtics because I thought they could clash trying to you know be the guy. So I think Tatum has done a great job of allowing Brown to be Brown. You know, they go through their little moments, but I think I think they've both done a great job. Pops, you're not gonna get off the hook. The same question for you. Who's 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 the best player on the Celtics? Oh, I agree with Coach. I, I think ultimately there are two incredibly talented individuals that have finally found a uh, comfort zone where they can allow each other to have their own space and put their imprint on the basketball game. I think at times early on in their career they fought. You know, it yeah. was my turn, your turn. Or, oh, he's rolling. I got to get something going. They are comfortable in their own skin. And the number one priority for both of them right now is to win a championship and win ball games. So it's refreshing to see. And um, I, I tell you what, watching how patient Brown was in the first half and then all of a sudden in that third quarter in the second half, he began to put his foot on the gas pedal when Tatum wasn't, you know, taking over offensively. It's just the, the, the most impressive thing to me is the way they get after it defensively too. They, they are complete basketball players. Yeah. But, Coach, let me ask you, um, as the godfather of Kyrie Irving, you got to be awfully proud, not just as a basketball player and what he's been able to accomplish as a basketball player, but his growth and maturity as an individual. It is, it, it, he, he doesn't give enough acknowledgement for, obviously, he was a smart guy all along, but right. he has matured and he's taken accountability for some of the mistakes he's made. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely proud of that. But like I've always said, even when he was going through all that stuff, you know, just knowing him, knowing his background, knowing Pops, 
you know, Kyrie's a solid young man. Uh, you know, I think sometimes he thinks outside the box and and sometimes, you know, I don't know, we live in this little world where everybody thinks everyone has to be like the other. You know, we, we try to live in this cookie cutter. And sometimes people are just different, their ideas, their thoughts. Uh, and I think it just had to catch up. Like, uh, I think Kyrie just understanding that some people probably not going to understand him uh, and just trying to live in basketball. Uh, you know, I think he's done a great job of that. Uh, and, and I also believe, like I honestly believe that he's in Dallas, Mark Cuban, Nico, uh, Matt. Jay Kidd. Yeah, Matt is out there, <laughs> Jay Kidd. Uh, uh, and I think he just feels like this is a group of people that, you know, that that kind of care about the person and deal with him as a person and not so much as a basketball player. I don't think sometimes, I don't think, like, I think Kyrie's a great basketball player that loves basketball, but probably doesn't care for all the other things, you know? And if he could just be that basketball player, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think it would have been an easier time for him. But he's definitely matured. Uh, just And, you know, listen, man, everything is about experience, right? You got to go through it. You got to have an understanding of it. And now he's the experienced guy. Now he's walking in those locker rooms and in these big games and he's able to speak about it. You know, he's able to have people follow him. But I also watch him and Luca and I think that's a great relationship there. Like I watch how they talk about each other. I watch how they embrace each other. I watch Kai clear the court out for him. I watch Kai go in the corner, let Luca do what he has to do. Uh, you can see there's a lot of grace for each other. Uh, and I think that's important. Can you imagine if they played us together? Oh, man, don't go there, man. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about that. Like, I, y'all, don't, y'all don't know, seriously, because you don't know how many times I, I, I think back to that. And, and I'm going to say this right in front of y'all. Like, like that, was one, that, was, that was tough, right? Because to be quite honest, I didn't expect the Knicks to pick me, right? I just saw this thing the other day, too. You you know, I, I messed up, Mark, because I said y'all were holding hands. I'm not for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wasn't. No, he wasn't. Right, but I said it on the podcast before, so I got to correct myself. <laughs> right. no, that was a low-key shot at me. I'm like, this dude got to be holding hands. Me. No, it wasn't a shot. It was like, I honestly thought that, though, like, at that time. <laughs> no, but... Uh, <laughs> No, it was tough because, like, 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 Mark was just rookie of the year, and I heard mm-hmm. you talk about this on the podcast earlier. Like, really, I was shocked to be picked. I was inspect. I didn't want to go there with the rookie of the year. I wanted my own team, so I wasn't. So listen, they told me at number fifteen, my agent told me, and I fired him. But he told me that <laughs> that, that I would be picked at fifteen, and, and if. Uh, you know, they told me Seattle, if, if if I didn't go before that, Seattle would pick me. So when Seattle didn't pick me, I was nervous because my coach from college called me, told me I was dropping in the draft and told me the Lakers in Boston called. So I'm like, oh, man, like I might go in the second round. So once Seattle picked, I started looking at the, the thing up top and I saw the Knicks, Houston, it was like Denver, it was Utah. I uh, forgot who else, but it was all these teams who had point guards. So I'm I'm nervous. I don't know if you watch me get up. Like, I, I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused. So them picking me, like, I knew who they had. I watched them. I was in the dorms watching them play the Bulls, Mark killing the Bulls. So I'm like, <laughs> you know, so, but, you know, as the competitor, come on, let's go. Let's, you know, whatever. But me and Mark was there. We were two guys who should have started. And it was like, and Mark can tell you this, like we were cool as I don't know what. But there was still an awkwardness at times, right? Because we were competitors. You had the families. Like it was a lot in New York City. <laughs> so we right there, you know? So yes. it was like this little funny friction. But for the most part, it was the utmost respect. Uh and then, you know, eventually I'm like, y'all got to let me go. Like, I'm not, I don't want to sit behind Mark, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but the craziest part is they let me go and then they messed him over. Like, and I, I never, like, I could never understand that, right? I'm, I'm, I go to San Antonio, and Mark, you might remember this, because this is how cool we were. And this was probably 
not that cool, but we played y'all in San Antonio. You weren't playing. And I looked at you over in the bench, and I was kind of like laughing, right? But, <laughs> but no, but you got to understand, it's like it was a lot, because me and Mark used to joke a lot, like, and so, but I was standing there, and I was, but I wasn't laughing, like, trying to be on some, but but right. I really was, like, baffled, like, yo, he's sitting over there, <laughs> bit of me, and they're actually sitting him, right? Wow. It was the weirdest, weirdest thing. Yeah. And I don't know, and I'm a, I know I didn't go along. Mark may not remember. We 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 were in Portland together. I think you might have been playing there, and I had just got there. Maybe something happened, but we wound up in a restaurant. And I remember telling you, uh, I understand what you felt because I had Avery Johnson behind me in San Antonio. You might not even remember this, but I was like, I get it. Like I understand. Like how do you think you're supposed to be playing before me? <laughs> 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 and you know, Avery's great, so that's not a shot. But I'm just saying, as a starter, you know, so right, you know, yeah, yeah. No, we 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 had a great relationship. It was as tough. A, I mean, imagine it was easy to games. I'm facing this yeah. dude every day in practice, yeah. you know, getting after it. And back then, you practice, so it was yeah. scrimmaging, one on ones, five on five, shell yeah. drills, yeah. everything. And this is the guy I got to match up with. And, and quite honestly, the thing that frustrated me, I loved him, but he never got hurt. I don't care what happened. He <laughs> yeah, down and you think, oh, he's out for a month. This dude, get right back up. He's like, let's go. I'm like, man, could you sit out? <laughs> sit out one, one, one drill? Yeah. Can you sit out a game? Can I, can I get a breather? Right. But when they put us in together, like it was electric. Like it would be those little moments and we yeah. would find each other, right? We ain't got to say nothing to each other. We all, we didn't talk about it or anything. But as soon as we got on the court, we knew we was going to make each other look good, right? Yeah. So that was already there. If you drop us in the now, right, we could play a one, two, well, you know, game, make it a little taller now. But back then, for sure, like I could have guarded the two at times or he mm -hmm. could have guarded the two at times depending on who it was, right? We could have mm -hmm. figured that out easily. But back then... It was more robotic, point guard, two guard, uh, point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center, and you know they just they just couldn't see it. I wish, yeah. I wish I would have handled it differently. Like I almost say we should have went in there and just told Rick Pitino, like, "Yo, coach, man, play us together, right?" Right. But what you doing? You're not, you're not even thinking like that, right? Because I'm just trying to figure out, like, I want to play, and this mm -hmm. dude in front of me, and I don't, how am I? How am I gonna solve this problem? Yeah. And every time we played in Madison Square Garden, the people were waiting for that moment. Yeah, they were begging for that moment, and it was, you know this was two of their own guys that they wanted to see on the floor together. One fun, funny story, I, I joke all the time. So we're in practice, and and I guess obviously I'm not sensitive enough to Rod being the backup position when he should be playing alongside of me. So I'm joking and all of a sudden. No, no, no. came in one day. Well, he hold was on, on Paul. You yeah, the two. Y'all were winning. No, it, it was like they were having the best of the day. And you um, know your pops, you know, he a little jovial a little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, dude's, this dude swelled up on me, man. He ready to fight me. <laughs> hey, listen, oh listen. Hey, look. Every time he tried to go off the ball screen, he would knock yeah. him off the ball screen. <laughs> These are the stories I need, Coach. Yeah, hey, Rick Matino kicked me out. He kicked me out. <laughs> but he tried to come off the ball screen, ball screen like three times. I just kept knocking him off the ball. <laughs> but he was so good and so cool, right? He knew how to handle that. He knew how to play that yeah. with out of control, and he all cool with it. <laughs> no, but I tell you, though, an all-time great player, as great a finisher as we've seen below the rim in the history of this game, as great a ball handler that we've seen in the history of this game. Who was the guy that you watched growing up that was the guy that you wanted to emulate? Yeah, so it's, it's crazy because Magic Johnson was my guy. Like, mm. that was it. I used to go to the sporting goods store, buy the black uniform with the white stripes and, and have them place Magic on the back, <laughs> you know, with his number. And I walked around with a basketball all day. Uh, so it was Magic. It was uh, George Gervin. Uh, it was Dr. J was my favorite of all, right? It was Dr. J, the Magic, but Magic was a point guard. So I emulated him more. But even, like, going to the basket and the reverses, that was all Dr. J. Then I loved George Gervin. You know, I liked Pete Maravich. And then, you know, the great Dwayne Pearl Washington, 
you know, after a while, the in and out was kind of because of Pearl Washington. Uh, but those guys were the guys I kind of emulated. Or even Isaiah Thomas, uh, too. I don't I don't say his name enough, but he was part of that vision of mine, you know, as as a as a point guard. Now, now, Coach, I hear you name that list of great point guards that influenced you. At what at what moment did you realize as a young kid in the city, hey, hey I might have something something special in these hands? Yeah, so I, I I would say, and I don't like I would like to hear Mark after, but I don't know. Back then, the visual wasn't that. Like the visual was like I'm watching my idols on TV, right? I love watching them play. I I don't even know if I right away it was like. I'm going to be a pro. I want to be a pro. I just was watching and admiring. Then mm-hmm. as I played in the parks, got better and better. I would love to be, you know, an NBA player. But I never had this like I knew it, right? I just kept trying to be better as a player in my space. So as a 10-year-old, I'm trying to get better. Then I go to junior high school. Then high school, you know, I became an All-American. I remember uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Tyrone Joy, came to me in front of the gym and told me my senior year, going into my senior year, he told me I was top 10 in the country. And I was like, wow. So like, I never, I always, I never thought I was the guy, right? Mm -hmm. I knew I was really good. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I was confident in all that. But I didn't know till like college, uh, probably during my freshman year, we played against Georgetown. And I had a good game. You know, you go back to watch the game. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Push back to the door, turn the game on. And uh, uh, Al McGuire was like a star is born. And I was like, wow. All right, I'm, I got a chance. But I, it was, I never felt a lock until I, until I got drafted. Like, like to like say, okay, I'm an NBA player. But even getting to the NBA, I still had anxiety because I wasn't for sure. They were grown men at that time. So, I, I, I mean, I was confident, but I didn't know – where I was going to place myself. And then when I got there and I started playing, I'm going to be honest, I was like, wow, this is a little easier than I thought. Like, because the court was so open and, you know, it just, you know, yeah. so it just naturally, naturally happened. I never thought, well, when I when I was in college, I knew I was, you know, one of the guys. But, yeah, yeah. That's but that Bronx talking. That, that's that Bronx that's talking that. right there. <laughs> I'm saying I knew I was one of the guys, but I never, like, it it took a while. It took a while. It's not like now, you know, you're in fifth grade and you just know you're going to be a pro. Yeah. No, you make a great point because I can remember, you know, obviously you you know you're good in middle school, you know you're good in high school, you know you're good in college. But even when you get to college, like I was a high school American, I get to college, a dude by the name of Kevin Williams who who was had graduated and he came back just to work out. He's trying to make the pros and he's dominating the pickup games that we're in. I'm like, I'm nowhere near. And I'm sure you going to DePaul, right. the guy from our hometown and Kenny Penny Patterson was absolutely <laughs> off the charts. I'll and, tell you and, that and, story, but yeah. So, I mean, he had a handle. He had he had everything other than the ability to shoot, but he was a skilled, legitimate, big New York City point guard that was trying to, trying to make it. So we had it right in front of our face, like how tough the challenge was going to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I played Kenny and pick up. He was a, he, he. I came in. He was leaving, but he made sure I knew who he was on the way out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. He was he like, yeah, this ain't TV. he was like, this ain't TV. You know, this ain't TV. This ain't TV. Pop, pop. I was like, wow. Okay, took me about a week to figure that out. <laughs> coach, coach, I got a question for you because I hear a lot of people people talking, and I got two of the greatest point guards in New York history sitting here. So I need to ask both of y'all. They've been saying that New York is no longer the mecca of basketball. What, what y'all, how y'all feel about this, man? First, first, Coach, Coach Rod, let me know what you think. I, I mean, times have changed. Like, you know, like I feel like we were the mecca. Like, we, like it originated. That style that we watch now, like, you know, New York. You know, we know yeah. back in the day when you walked out of New York, there was a something about a New York uh, player, point guard, guard. There was a flair to it. And it's like the NBA, you know, it's so global now, right? Yeah. It started here and now it's all over. So I think it started 
at the Mecca in New York. And now, I mean, you go everywhere and there's guys who are playing like New York ball players. Uh, so is it the same? I don't, I don't know if I want to say we're down, but everyone's up. You know, the world has changed. You go to any city, any playground, any gym, and you can see identical things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I would probably compare it to New York City point guards and New York City players to the impact that the Dream Team had around the country. Blame the Dream Team how, why you see so many global superstars in the NBA today because they were able to tangibly see the impact, the way, we, the way they played, the way they performed, and work on their craft. But New York City point guards and players – Everybody was able to emulate it because they, they saw us on the biggest stage. And now all of a sudden, they, 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 quite honestly, they, they, they've caught up to us. Yeah. But it's no shame of, of the impact that the New York City players had on, on, on the global impact as far as performances and players all around the world. How does that affect you recruiting-wise as a coach at LIU? Uh, meaning, what you mean? Like, do you are, are you locally or globally, do you... Do you, do you no, I think uh, it's... I think you have to recruit, you know. Uh, I think was, I think I'm lucky because I've been in so many places, so many relationships, you know. Even being uh, with Ignite uh, and 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 just recruiting all over, and even being with Memphis and Kentucky with Cal. So there's a lot of relationships. So uh, you know, obviously New York is is the city, but. You know, I think I have the ability to to, to kind of recruit uh, in many different areas. Yeah, I, I say this respectfully. You're a hidden gem. You don't get enough acknowledgement and enough credit of your impact on the game. When you talk about Memphis and Kentucky, we're talking about the guards that came across Memphis and Kentucky in college and became superstars, all stars, MVPs, and you had you were hands on with those guys, day to day with those guys instilling confidence in those guys, instilling principles, instilling habits in those guys, you truly don't get enough credit when we talk about, and it, it, the list goes on and on, but Derrick Rose primarily, John Wall, the, the greats that you had the privilege to be around on a day-to-day basis. Can you just talk about that? Yeah, I think, so I'm, I'm going to be quite honest, and I always say, like, you know, those, those young fellas, like, those are great players. They walked in there great, right? I think no, but you can't. You, that's not that's not what's in style. Because I, I know people that say they're Steph Curry's shooting coach. Like, are you serious? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I can't. Why? Why? Whoa, why, why people catch his face, Pop? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying. Yeah, I can't. I can't do that one because those were great players. I think what happens a lot is like you almost guide them and help them through that process, right? Because I remember telling D. Rose and, and J. Wall and those guys, and even Tariq, you know, because Cal is a rah-rah in your face and he's at you. And it's like, this is going to be the easiest. No, this will be the hardest time in your basketball life. If you can get through this, when you get up to the top, like, you're good, right? So embrace this part of it, you know? It's kind of helping them through that day-to-day. And, and obviously, you know, giving them tips and helping them out and all that. But those guys are special. They walked into college special. Uh, I, I'm I'm happy to be a part of that, right? Because I can walk around and I can see those guys and I know I was a part of something special, right? You know, we won the national title with Anthony Davis and Mike Gilchrist and Deron Lamb, Terrence Jones, uh, and all those guys. Like, just to be able to see those guys, watch them flourish, watch them become adults, have families, grown men, all-stars, millionaires, almost billionaires, like to be a part of that history, uh, because that's what it is. You're a part of it. You're a part of of, of that growth and, and their journey. And it's not many, you know, how many are going to have that opportunity. Now, Coach, I, I hear you speaking about the impact that you had on these players. And I know that with, with the recruiting process, you're around a lot of young players. So could you comment on uh, what your thoughts are as far as the state of youth basketball right now? Don't ask me that question. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> how do I answer that? B- brutally uh, honest? I, I, no, no, no. I mean, it's basketball. Times have changed. 
things evolve. Uh, you know, obviously there's a lot of talent out here, right? Uh, I mean, like quite honestly, I think it's a lot for young people now, right? Because you got social media, you know, you got all the other people around and it's more because there's more money involved, you know, uh, from back in the day. Uh, so sometimes it's tough for these young guys. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I think it's <laughs> – Y'all got me all stumped over here because I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, because I'm trying. No, because there are, like, there are issues, obviously, right? Uh, I think it needs to be more stability. I think, you know, uh, giving young people so much so soon, you know, just the idea of everybody believes they're going to be a pro. Uh, sometimes you don't understand the work. Sometimes you don't understand the challenge. Sometimes it's hard to intake information because sometimes you get too much too soon, right? And so I think there's a there's a little issue in that. I think we got to focus and fix that a little bit. We have great talent, right? These, these kids and even watching the game, like if I look back at how we played and what they're doing now, I would love to play now, the way the court is open, the freedom. But I think on the, on the lower level, uh, I think the teaching probably has to change. I think the delivery, I think just like like I, I was with Team Ignite. And one thing I, I saw that was that was interesting to me, like we would have Zoom calls and we would meet with, with prospective, you know, uh, Ignite players. And I always said, like, when we when we spoke to the European players, like they all spoke for themselves. Uh, they all had questions like Dyson Daniels was on there with a notepad. I was in awe of him and he's writing stuff down and he's articulating himself. He's asking questions. Uh, and, you know, our guys don't really do that. Right. Most of the time people are speaking for them and they're kind of, you know, quiet. And, you know, sometimes I think that's a part of it, too. Right. You know, like the the the. How can I say it? The kind of the, to, like 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 the European guys, they just wanted to hoop. They just wanted to figure out how to get better, right? Because if I can get better, all that other stuff, all the glow, the money, the whatever, that's going to come. And yeah. I think we got to teach that a little more, right? Because things can get twisted. You come from being a young guy, you you people put so much on you, right? So now, how does that compute in your head, right? Sometimes you may think you're better than you are. So then mm -hmm. now, how do you intake information, right? How do you really get better? That's why if you look at the league, I believe there's a lot of guys who come on late. And now we got these older guys who have to develop, who have to, like, go through adversity or who have to stay the course. And mm -hmm. then they become pros and, you know, they go second round, but they're plugged into a system because they can figure it out. And some of these young guys, you give so much to and you teach them that it's about them. Well, now you get to play. You got to play. Ultimately, you got to play with other great players. And then ultimately, you got to be a role player. And if you can and some don't have the understanding that being a great role player gives you millions of dollars. Like, I mean, life changing. I mean, real life changing. And so sometimes I just think we got to refocus a little bit. When as they're moving up and growing up, like teaching them those type of things. Talk to me about, I know it's got to be an incredible feeling as a coach to be able to coach. You're fortunate enough to coach two of your boys, two yeah. of your sons. And I watched you coach them and yeah. Yeah, they're pretty good players and they're, they're, they're in the rotation and impactful players for you. Talk yeah. about that experience. No, it was great. Like, I, I, I think the man upstairs, like, like he knew that was needed. Like, I was happy to have a chance to have them on the court. I wish they could have been healthy more because uh, both of them were injured. My youngest one, Terrell, was injured a lot this year. Uh, and Ty had some injuries uh, that kind of set him back. But to be able to give them an experience, uh, especially my oldest one, Ty, who's kind of gone through different schools and different places with different adults who may not have treated him, you know, accordingly, uh, so to be able to have that opportunity to have them with me and 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 they help me, uh, you know, as players, right? Both of them are tough defensively. They're going to compete. 
Uh, so it was great. It was a great experience. I wish I had time for another year. Uh, I'm glad I have Terrell uh, uh, for another year. Uh, I'm looking forward to him having a, a, a great year next year and to uplifting, you know, uh, LI, the LIU Sharks. But it was it was it was a wonderful experience, and there was ups and downs. Now, right, <laughs> got your kids there, and you got to be a coach. And you know, we we had our moment, but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I got a question. This this young puppy, we always argue. Who is the greatest <laughs> basketball player of all time, in your opinion? Say that again. Who is the greatest basketball player of all time, in your opinion? Well, you already know. Like, so there's a couple, right? MJ is, you know, I can spit that out quickly. But sometimes I feel like magic is devalued, right? But MJ, right? But I can, I'm, I'm a magic guy too. Because I look at magic and I say, we watch all these big guys now. Like, that's that's magic, right? Magic started that. All the big guys you see now handling the ball and passing is magic. Uh, but MJ was like, in my time, the most dominant, right? And then he was the most feared, like, and I hate sometimes because I hear I hear uh, older players talk about him, and the reverence sometimes is a little bit too much for me. <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. A weird, <laughs> but but thank you, like, thank you, coach. No, but he was like Mark, he was that guy, right? And you knew when he walked in the gym, you know, and it wasn't just it was the whole thing around him and everything, you know? Uh, and he was the guy who kind of springboarded and took the league to another level. Uh, but, I mean, he was he was tough. He was a killer defensively. And I heard some guys online say he didn't play defense. That's absolutely untrue. Now, he got away with hacking, just like some of these <laughs> small <small-time> guys. <clears throat> Crucial times of the game. But, but uh Nah, he was a complete player. And, you know, they talk about his left hand. Yeah, he didn't have the greatest left hand, but uh, he's getting to wherever he wants to get to. You know, he knows how to maneuver on the court. He knows, you know, technically sound. Like, I don't, you know, and, and I know the LeBron, MJ, and I stopped arguing on that, but I would just say in my time, it's, it's MJ. The greatest career may be LeBron. But, like, I was there. I felt MJ. Like, I knew the force, you know? Uh, you know, so. I saw some clips. You had a day against them when you was in Washington, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought those clips, too. <laughs> he said I did a little something. Yeah, was something. <laughs> you know, he couldn't, it, it was tough for him to guard guards. Like, you know, MJ's supposed to guard the big guys. He's not supposed to guard the the guard, so, and I could, so I used to play against the Bulls, and they, Mark knows, like, you get in half court, they they backing off you long length, like, you in trouble. So if you watch a lot of those films, like, I'm getting in transition. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I knew my advantage was getting in transition because I knew they're going to back off, they're going to sag, and if it's a night that I'm not making shots, it could be a long night. So I yeah. tried to make sure I can get in transition as much as possible. No, my I appreciate your answer, co- answer coach, because pop my pop's trying to trying to pit us against each other. He wants us to have the whole LeBron debate. Like you though, I told him I'm maturing. I'm not even trying to go down that path. He's trying to pull the worst side of me out every day. Come on, pop, stop, man. <laughs> I'm so That's glad you, I didn't have to coach him. Son. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Question for you though. I don't know if you remember. Blue, we sh- we shut down New York City. Yes. Uh, summer league at City College. Everybody wanted us to play against each other. Everybody wanted us to play together, but we both faced each other and the streets were talking. We had a big summer league game at City College in New York City. Holds thousands of people. <laughs> half the city, Rye going to bust them up. Half the city, Mark going to bust them up. We locked it down. And had inc- Both of us played great, but it was, a, it, was a, it was a special moment. I don't know if you remember that. Absolutely, because you know why I remember, and, and I don't think you remember this, it was almost like the I believe it was the day after the draft. That's why I was so crazy. Right. Oh, crazy. Like we went through this draft, like they drafted me, rookie of the year. And so the next day, we're playing this big game at City College, I believe it was. Yeah. And the line, it was crazy. And we both, I don't know, um, we both probably had 40 or 
close yeah, to I it. Yeah, I think I have 41, you have 40, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's crazy? No, but I ain't gonna lie, I ain't wanna say that, but I do believe he had a little more that day. I do no, believe I don't that. Know. I don't say that. No, no, I remember, but I wasn't gonna say that, but since you said it, you know. <laughs> well, well yeah, let me just throw it out there. a really good game, and we Here's what bothers me. Here's what bothers me. My final, my last year at St. John's University, we're in the NCAA tournament. Why am I senior year ends with a loss against Rod Strickland and the DePaul yeah. basketball team? Crazy. I still, I, it That's still crazy. bothers me. I don't know crazy. if you remember. I had a teardrop in the paint as the buzzer sounded to win the ball game, and it rolls out. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> and Mark, I hate to say this, but I beat you the year before, too. <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't remember all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, I had Walter Berry. I just watched it on YouTube the other night. Oh, send, send that through. Send that. No, no, no. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. But they, 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 they had a heck of a basketball team, though. Yeah, you yeah. guys you guys were underrated and were loaded at every position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my junior year, I think. And yeah. then uh, we played against uh, LSU and this kid named Dal Joe who kind of bullied. No, that wasn't that year. No, that wasn't that year. My bad. Wrong year. Who is who? Who is the best coach you ever played for? Man, there's so many. I, I hate to do that. Uh, I loved Rick Alderman. You know, Larry Brown was great. Uh, but I, I played for Pat Riley one year, man. And I know everybody thought we were going to be all in water, and maybe because it was late in my career. But I enjoyed Pat Riley so much, man. Like, because one thing I knew is he's going to tell you it right to your face. You're going to know where he stands. And Pat Riley was like this. If you win, I love you. If you lose, I hate you. Right. That's how right. he acted. And I was cool with that, right? Because I knew I wouldn't, I didn't have to worry about it. assistant coach coming to me with some BS. I'm getting it straight from him. So I really, I, I, I really enjoyed playing for Pat Riley. You make a great point because I played for him for one year also. One thing I appreciate, first of all, is incredible leader yes. and uh, motivator. And he treated the guys, you can't get treat, treated any better yes. across the board, flying, eating, hotels, all of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, like you said, he'd sit the chairs in front of in, in front of the wall at the, at, at the start of practice, and he's going to tell you exactly what he feels. So you, there's no guessing. Yeah. He's going to hold you accountable. Yeah. So so it, th that approach and that mentality becomes contagious, not only to the guys in suits, but the guys in uniform. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that time. Uh, I wish I had a little more time now. Now, Coach, I want to I want to ask you, uh, what's your thoughts on the on the recent rise of the women's basketball game? Uh, it's been great. I mean, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about Caitlin Clark. Uh, been a lot, of, you know, some controversy, but I think the you know I would hope the ladies would just embrace it because I think it's it's great for the game. It's great for them. You know, the more eyes on her is the more eyes on everyone else. Uh, and I think it's good. Like, you know, the little fouls and the the hard foul. Like, man, that's a part of basketball. You know, I think there's been other greats who've come in and and, and, and have had to go through that. And, and really, honestly, I think it's going to make her legacy even greater, right? At the end of the day, if she becomes that great player, you know, this is the storyline. You know, she had to come in with all of that on her and then, you know, help the WNBA grow, like it can become a great story. And to like Angel Reese, who, who you know, she plays that other part, which we got to love and, and embrace as well, right? Because she, yeah. she wants a piece of that attention. She wants, you know, she wants everybody to know she can play. Like mm -hmm. I think we should embrace all of that. I don't think anything's wrong with any of that. Uh, but I don't think, you know, now it's so bad because we got, you know, social media and we got a bunch of catty grown men that want to talk about catty stuff all the time. <laughs> so that makes it, you know, a little different. But I, I, you know, I love the fact that that they're talking about it. No one's talked about the WNBA the way they they should in a while. So now we're here. So they're getting attention, you know, but I think they should carry themselves the right way. I, I, I you know, I saw... I don't know. I just I just hope they they handle it the right way because it's it's only going to be great for them. Like in the long run, it's going to be a great thing. Yeah. And you've seen some some great. I mean, come from New York City, we've seen some great women's basketball players historically. The talent level, obviously, and the skill level is far superior to today. But we've seen 
some of the best uh, in the history of the game come from New York City. And, and, and even Therese Webspoon, who's coaching in Chicago, playing yeah. for New York and Madison Square Garden, special moments that she had. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's a great thing. You know, I, I, I have my tournament, uh, the Rod Strickland tournament in New York City that I've had since, what, like 1994. So, you know, there's, there's been WNBA players who have played – in, in that tournament, you know, so it's great to watch them. So, you know, New York is, I mean, you know, New York is the Mecca. It's good to see. But I'm just like, honestly, I'm just happy the women are getting some recognition now. People are getting eyes on the game. Uh, and then they'll be able to now, let's see what happens. And and they're getting better and better and better. The talent is better. We're going to see somebody dunking one of these days, probably sooner than later, dunking consistently. And I think that game is just going to keep growing. How, how much would it impact Indiana Fever with Caitlin Clark if they had a woman's version of a Charles Oakley that would clean up some of the mess? <laughs> she wouldn't have any problems. It would be, be a wrap if she had a Charles. What? It'd a, yeah, it would be a wrap. Charles, Charles yeah, it would be a wrap. It wouldn't be any problems at all. We mm-hmm. played against Phoenix one time, and I think Jeff Hornacek, like, knocked me down. And Oak was like, I thought he was going to beat him up. I'm like, no, nah, not that one. I'm <laughs> Leave that for somebody. <laughs> for Just leave him alone. But yeah, no, nah, she would she would have no problems at all. <laughs> so the people know that I'm not lying. My grape story on the plane with Charles Oakley slugging Sydney Green is 100 percent true, isn't it? Yes. The only thing is I didn't participate. That's the only that's the only lie in that story. I didn't have anything to do with that. I didn't Are you anything. serious? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Brian Strickland is lying, man. <laughs> no, no, no. I might have been like the brainchild of that. I don't know. It was, it was, it was a combo or something. <laughs> but, but no, the funny thing is we were like, man, somebody do that again. I'm going to, you know. So as soon as he turned around, we like, ah. <laughs> Start throwing the grapes. <laughs> and then got up and went straight to Oak. But I got to tell this story, and I hope my man Pete Myers will be mad at me. But I got to tell, because this is part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so after that happened, I shouldn't have said Pete's name, my bad. So, no, don't worry about it. It's, it makes it better. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't know. Maybe I was the only one there. So after that happened, Sid, you know, he got the cut eye and everything. He's hot. So we get off the plane and we going on the bus. So <laughs> we going on the bus. So Sid is in the front and Pete is walking off the bus and I'm walking behind me. <laughs> and Sid just took Pete's head <laughs> and slammed it on him. <laughs> on top of the, on top of the, <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, oh, Pete, that no way. My God, man, I hope Pete don't hate me for this, man. But yeah, and I'm right behind Pete, right? But Pete ain't do anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was guilty. I felt because you know Pete was my guy. I'm like, man, he just took his head, bow. Yeah. I'm so glad you shared that story. He's going to hear about it. Matter of yeah. fact, he watches. So, I, that, that, I just got to say, I just got to say, if nobody going to stand up for him, that's not the Coach Pete that I know. I don't know him <laughs> for that being done to him. I don't know. Oh, man. Oh, I, I should have said that. I, I, I said the name too quick. I said the name. No, I'm getting off this call, and I'm going to call Pete to make sure whether it happened or not. So I have that answer. At least his side of the story. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, well, we want to say thank you so much, you coach. It's the it's the legendary Rod Strickland in the building. We appreciate the time that you took out tonight, just talking to us, and um, it's just a blessing, man. We appreciate you so much. No, nah, appreciate you guys, man. Appreciate yeah, you, man. guys. Can we cut Thanks. that last part out about Pete though? Can we cut? Not a chance. Not a chance. <laughs> he, he banged his head on the uh, on the on the. On the, on the, on the, on the he, must, he must have. He must have. <laughs> That's a wrap for this episode of the Mark Jackson Show. I'm Mark Jackson. That's a dynamic one. My guy, Blue, thanks so much to the legend, the great Rod Strickland, for spending some time with us, stopping by. Look forward to having him in studio real quick soon. Just want to give a special shout-out. Thoughts and prayers. Basketball lost one of its royal members, the great legend, Jerry West. 
I want to send out thoughts and prayers to his wonderful wife, Karen, and his boys. Jerry West played a huge part in my life, especially in my coaching career. Working with the Golden State Warriors, presented me with an opportunity to coach for three years, spent days with him, spent hours with him, just picking his brain, and uh, nothing but respect and love for him. So we lost a great one, and uh, just want to spend special love and support and prayers to his family, his friends, and his many fans. As great a basketball career as we've seen, as a player, as a coach for a short period of time, and as importantly, as an executive. Rest in peace, legend. Remember, stop going places where you got no business going. You're going to wind up catching an L. Old man once said, I'm afraid of sharks, but only when I'm in the water. If I catch one on my block, it's on. Stay where you have the advantage and secure the victory. Blessings. <laughs>